Welcome to CIT 150. This is uh, week one, chapter two. Uh, my name is Jeff Seaman, and I am the faculty uh, professor teaching this class. So this this week or this session is going to be about the motherboard. So I do have note taken up here, so I would recommend that you take notes. I'm not going to be able to take notes for everything, but I'm just going to throw some jot some information down. So what I'm going to do is on chapter two, I'm going to kind of go through some of the the more important areas. I mean, I recommend that you read the entire chapter because there's a lot of detail information in there that I'm not going to cover in a lecture, but I'm going to cover like the highest overview, talk about some important factors and so forth. Um, so we'll start off. What is a motherboard? You know, type that in there. What is a motherboard? You know, a motherboard, you know, it basically, the sound of it, when you hear it for the first time, you're like, okay, we all have a, you know, majority of us, you know, we all came from one person. We came from a woman. So she's our mother. And think of that as a principal, um, uh, principal um, attribute. You know, the mother is the, you know, central person. You know, the mother is who gives birth to the kids. Well, a motherboard is not exactly the same way, but it holds very important components. So a motherboard can be used in so many different lines of business. Uh, motherboards used on your television. So if you've ever got the nerve or, or kind of um, uh, had, had the, uh, uh, it, it, you were interested in seeing what the um, TV looks like, you could easily open it up and see it's just basically a circuit board. Um, you're, when you open up a computer and you install um, a driver, such as, say, a video card, it's just a circuit board. Uh, if you've ever had the, um, if you've ever, brave enough to open up the back of your phone, whether you have an Android device or iOS or even a um, Windows phone. It's just a circuit board. Everything has a circuit board, and it all is very important how the circuit board's established. So in this topic, we're going to talk about a motherboard, a very important piece of a computer, whether it's a laptop or a desktop, or even, like I mentioned, a uh, smartphone. It uses a, a motherboard. Uh, each one is different size and so forth, but the one that we're going to commonly talk about is the one that is installed on desktop computers or those all-in-one computers. So once again, we say, what is a motherboard? It's basically, in a nutshell, it's a printed circuit board. And if you looked at it, it's just a bunch of print lines that is the foundation of a computer. Um, where is it located? Well, located at the bottom of the computer case but if you have a computer case that is um, a, like a, a, a one that stands up then it's on the side um, it, you know it, it allows com it allows some of the most important components to talk to each other such as CPU central processing unit you know what is a central processing unit it's think of it as the brains behind brains behind everything well I wouldn't say it's the brains it's it well it's we'll say it um, is the speed and brains like the nervous 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 system and then we have uh, other things such as the RAM random access memory so RAM is the memory. Um, it remembers things and provides performance on applications that require larger memory banks. So, for example, let's say that you know your parent tells you to go to the store, and well, let's you know let's not even use that example. Let's say that you're a police officer. As a police officer, you have to remember so many attributes of th things. So you may have potentially be cruising down and you've seen something happen, an accident or, or a crime that happened. You have to remember absolutely everything. You have to remember the street that you're on. You have to remember who was standing um, around you when the, when, the, when the accident occurred, when the crime occurred. Um, what did that person look like? What were they wearing? Um, that's a lot of information to remember as a police officer, but that's one of their most important jobs. When they go to the police academy, those are the things that they study. They study important pieces like that because 
being able to provide as much detailed information as possible is very helpful. Nowadays, there's so many different technologies. Some of the cops have uh, video cameras on their um, on their vests, and they're able to pick up stuff. But not all police stations have that technology or have that funding to get that technology, so they have to remember things. So think of it as the RAM, as memory. The more memory you have, the more you can remember. So you might have a younger cop who is just, you know, out of the police academy, he, his brain is basically like a sponge, like a two to four year old child that can just remember, absorb so much stuff, or remember so much stuff. That would be your um, high memory. That would be maybe your 16 gigabyte memory. But someone who's older and kind of forget, forgets things, he or she would be like your, eh, maybe your two gigabyte. You're like, I'm not going to use them because they're not going to be able to remember stuff. So that's just a, an example of random access memory. Um, another thing um, is hardware components. So what kind of hardware components that can be on a computer? Now this is a little tricky because things have changed in, in the past years. Um, we'll talk about previous years and talk about that and go from there. You could have a CD slash DVD player. Um, you could have a IDE slash um, SCSI uh, disk drive. You could have, um, those are some of the components you could have. You could have, which I'm doubt you're going to have this, is a floppy drive. Some of these are outdated. And why I say that is we'll learn about them, but computers nowadays don't really come with a CD drive anymore or DVD player. Um, they don't even come with an IDE or a SCSI drive. They use something called a, uh, either a flash drive or, or a um, solid state drive. It's something that's embedded on the motherboard. And floppy drive, well, I, don't, I think they quit putting floppy drives in there for the past 10 years at least. But these are just examples of things that are on a, a, a different hardware components that are on the board. Another component could be a video card. Now, that's very common still. Um, video cards can be uh, either in a slot, such as AGP, uh, stands for Accelerated Graphics um, Performance, so it could be on that or it could be on a PCI slot. HGP is a faster slot, but now they've come out with a faster PCI slot for performance. But nonetheless, those cards can very much be installed on there. The interesting thing about the PCI, it can install a bunch of different things. Um, back in the day, it was very, it was very uh, new that people would install like a, a, video, a video card uh, in their computer and this video card would have a coax cable and you would be able to hook up your cable and record stuff kind of like a DVR before the DVR even came out this was the technology that they had in place um, there's audio you could get audio cards um, most most um, Computers on the motherboard already has an audio port on it, and we'll talk more about that. So those are some of the features that you can get on there. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more. There's a lot of other different things that come with it, USBs and so forth. Um, so talk about the processor, you know. Um, so the special motherboard chip called the processor, processor, which basically determines the great extent of the power of the computer. Also, as I mentioned, central processing unit. That processor executes instructions, performs calculations, and coordinates input-output operation. So each motherboard has an electro electronic chip that works with the CPU and is in the design to exact specifications. So kind of an example is, all right, so have you ever, I'm just kind of got on a limb here, a lot of people watch sports. Um, if you've ever watched like an NFL game, or a, um, a uh, NBA game, or a Major League Baseball game, you ever notice that the announcers are so quick, they're like, well, uh, Antonio Brown, he scored uh, X amount of yards, and he's the only player in the past 18 years that's ever did this on a Sunday after 4 p.m. You're like, how do they know that? Well, they have these analysts that are called analytic, um, actually, they're called um, analytics uh, statisticians, and basically, not they're querying this information from a database, but they're using data analytic tools or they're doing manual um, 
uh, analytics to figure out these calculations. And it could be simple things like, okay, at a certain time of day, um, when the weather is this type, things like this can occur. And they could come up with a formula. And those people right there are called um, analytic, tech, uh, st basically statisticians. And they do all kind of different um, calcula calculations using different um, forms of algebra and geometry and so forth. That right there would be a perfect example of a CPU, even though that's an actual human and is never going to keep up with a CPU, what the CPU can do, but that's an example of, uh, of a CPU in uh, human form. Um, another thing we'll talk about is bits. So, you know, all processors use ones and zeros. Um, one or a zero is a bit. So eight bits grouped together are a byte to a processor. So the letter A looks like zero, one, and then like five zeros and a one. Um, you know, you want to you want to look at um, the different storage terms. So you want to understand the basics. So for example, term. Oh geez, what am I typing? Term. Let's say uh, kilobyte slash kilobyte uh, abbreviation, or also known as the uh, acronym is KB, or KB would be better. Um, for kilobytes. Uh, description could be like, um, let's see here, I think it's 1,000 bytes or two tenths, two to, t to the 10 power of, uh, of bytes. And if you look at page 46, there is a diagram on storage terms and binary. So you'll want to understand how many megabytes is in a, um, or how many megabytes. Uh, is a kilobyte or how many gigabytes is, is a megabyte. So for example, if you had a thousand kilo, thousand megabytes, how, what is that considered to a gigabyte? You'll want to understand terabyte. Um, very popular now that, you know, you could go and it's so crazy because I got my first computer in 1994. Okay. And it came with 16 megs of RAM, which was like top of the line, uh, 500 megabyte hard drive. And, um, uh, yeah, 500 megabyte hard drive, I believe, and and it was a 486 SX, and it was high, high power, two thousand dollars. Now it's just a joke because you could go get a thumb drive that has two terabytes on it. Imagine telling someone that 20 years ago, and they're like, "Whoa, that's insane." So you'll want to understand terabytes. You'll understand about petabytes. We haven't got to that. Exabytes, zettabytes, and yottabytes. Those are Maybe 20 years down the road, yettabytes will be something that's just like no big deal. And we'll be like, oh, wow. I remember back in the day they used terabytes. Who's using terabytes? So that's kind of how time goes by. So you want to look at page 46 and review that information. Um, another thing is talking about um, the internal and external data bus. So what is a bus? That's a very good question. So... Um, Basically, electric lines called a bus are used. So electric lines inside a CPU are known as internal data bus or a system bus. Um, so th think about this. They have, they have up to 16 separate lines, each carrying either one or zero. Um, the word size and the number of the lines from the internal data bus are equal. Like an 8086, for example, had 16-bit word size and 16 lines carried. 16 bits of the internal data bus. Um, so like in today's processor, which is very popular to have a 64-bit processor, or 128 data bus lines operate concurrently. So just think of it as, um, you know, a, a good way of thinking about it is the, the lines outside your house. If you have, you know, most of us all do have power. So we have electric lines. So these different lines are going from one part of the city to another part of the city, kind of Think of it that way. It's easier when you kind of relate to things um, based off of things that you're really familiar with. And then once you kind of put a concentration together, you're like, oh, that makes sense. All right, so moving on, we'll talk a little bit about the Intel processors and different processors. So by this time, you either you probably have an idea that, you know, Intel processors are the most popular processors. So yeah, back in the day, Apple computers... Um, before, right now, Apple computers are just the biggest hype. Um, you know, that's the computer to get. You know, not many people using a PC. Uh, but the, these um, Apple computers back in the day used a processor made by IBM, which was not really that fast of a processor. It wasn't able to keep up with the Intel processor. 
um, but at the, t at the time, you know, not that many people were really using Apple computers. You had the people that stuck with Apple from the beginning and so forth. But then um, Apple made a decision, and when Steve Jobs came back, he made a decision and said, you know what, we're going to switch to Intel. We're going to make a big move, which was, was huge because IBM was losing a ton of money, and Intel was gaining money. So by them switching, I believe it was in 2005 is when they made the, yeah, 2005 is when they came out with the first MacBook or Mac computer that had an Intel processor in it. Um, at that time, when that happened, it enabled people who had Mac computers to be able to install um, Windows on their computer through a uh, boot, uh, a, they had like a boot setup. So you could either boot up in Windows or you could boot up in, in Apple, and later on, um, technologies like Parallel and VMware and so forth came out to allow you to install Windows on your Mac only because it was using the same processor. Well, that was in 2005. Here it is in 2016. They have not switched back. They still have those same processors. Um, now, they, they're using, um, we'll talk about this later, but they're, um, they're, they're keeping up to date. And I, I've probably the past uh, five years, I've had uh, several Mac computers. And personally, I wouldn't switch back to a PC myself because it's just, uh, it's just um, easier to have the best of both worlds. Now, if I, if I want a desktop, um, I'm going to go with a PC for gaming rights and so forth. Um, but for what I do, I just keep a Mac. Um, but I never thought I, I, I would go in that direction. But getting back to processors, um, which is, this will find pretty ironic, I'm not sure if you know this, so, but the the Apple iPhone and the iPad, what processor do you think it's running? It's running Samsung's processor, which is the same processor as powering Android phones. Well, the phone's built by Samsung, or a tablet's built by Samsung, which is kind of funny, though, because Samsung, not only are they they make a money off their products that have Android device, Android operating system on it. But also, anything that iPhone sells, they're making money too because they're making a processor, which is very interesting. So, nonetheless, um, little thing about uh, core, um, well, Intel processors. Uh, there's different processors. There's the um, right now the most recent one is the Core i7. Um, some computers that you buy will have the Core i5. The 7, um, they have the regular 7 and then Extreme. So the Extreme is a multi-core with cache memory shared between cores. Um, used for a desktop and mobile devices designed for gaming and virtualization. Um, and then your regular Core 7 is just a multi-core with cache memory between cores and the board memory. Good for virtualization, graphic, multimedia design and creation and gaming. But the Core i7 Extreme, why are you going to have that? You're going to have it if you're developing games or if you're playing games, that's what you're gonna want. You're gonna want the fastest of the fastest at that time. Um, Core i5, um, most computers still run an i5. I think my computer itself is an i7. Um, it's about a year and a half old. They had the Core i3. And then you wanna know about the Pentium mobile, mobile family. Single or dual desktop laptop processor for general computing. Then there's the Celeron and the mobile. Celeron's a, it's, it's an Intel processor. It's not as fast as the as the core, but you know, it does its job and, um, and moving on. So that's basically your, I, your Intel processor family. Then you have your AMD processor family. AMD, AMD is basically Intel's largest rival in computer processors. Anyone buying a processor should do some research on models and vendors and so forth. Basically at the, at the end of the day, if you want a fast computer, you go with Intel. Not saying AMD, people have their opinions and they think, AMD is faster than um, Intel. I guess you just have to, um, AMD will be a little bit cheaper than, than Intel as well, as well. They have the FX, which is their multi-core, eight-core, high-performance desktop processor. They have the Fusion and then the ph Phenomen. Um, you know, if you're doing it, maybe you go to a store like a Best Buy, which is a great store, and have them compare an AMD processor versus a, uh, Intel and do some, do some uh, checking of the speed and see how fast things come up and go down and so forth. Um, all right, so talking about speeding up processors and operations and so forth, so some some motherboard speed terms uh, you'll hear about is uh, a clock or a clock speed. Basically, uh, important to know it's the speed of the processor internal clock measures in gigahertz. Um, another thing is the bus speed. It's the speed at which data is delivered from a particular bus or a motherboard being used. So 
Uh, important factors are bus speed and clock speed. Uh, another one I would say uh, your PCI bus speed. Uh, that's basically the speed of the slot that accepts PCI on the board. Uh, the other one would be the AGP bus speed. That is your um, basically your accelerated sil graphics card slot for your video cards. Um, and then that's pretty much it right there on, on the terms. Uh, another thing is cache. I think most of us have heard of the word cache before, whether it's uh, with uh, our browsers. Um, but cache is an important concept related to the processor because it's the speed that's keeping the data flowing into the processor. Um, it registers the high-speed memory, uh, the storage inside the processor. They're used temporarily to hold calculations, uh, data, or instructions. So just think of cache as uh, a way to hold temporary memory. So if you maybe told your uh, a neighbor a secret or, or a number between 1 and 10 and say, you know what, just hold that there for, I don't know, for a day or two and I'll get back to you. That would be your cache. Um, it's a very fast type of memory that's designed to increase the speed of the processor. But um, it's just, think of it as they have different levels. They have level 1, level 2, and level 3. Um, level 1 is um, basically uh, the cache memory that's integrated is the part of the processor as compared is would be your level one your level two would be um, uh, packaging uh, well level two is um, refer to it as the die on die cache um, so and then the, the third level is the higher end computer processor um, it's a uh, other part that's on the motherboard but it's just temporary memory um, that is on your board. Um, let's see here. Clocking. Just one second. Another important piece is threading technology. Threading plays a really huge role. Um, and it's just, this is a computer part, but if you're writing a computer program, um, depending on what program you're developing, um, threading it plays an important role of it. And it's based off the system because it's how much how much it can do in a certain amount of time. So threading technology, several threading te techniques are used um, to speed up the processor efficiency. efficiency. Uh, Multi-threading and hyper-threading technology. So a thread is, is basically a small piece of an application process that can be handled by the operating system. So the OS, such as Windows, schedules and assigns resources to a thread. Each thread um, can be resources such as the processor or a cache of memory. Um, with other threads, a thread uh, in a pipeline might have to delay doing, dealing with uh, waiting on data that could be retrieved or accessed and so forth. So an example would be if I had, let's see here, if I had a block basically, um, let's say I, it's going to be Really interesting. So let's say that right there is uh, thread one. All right, and then we had here thread two. Well, let's see that would be one and then delay. All right, so that would be thread one. Sorry, and then you might have thread one again, and then you would have your thread two. So you see the differences. You have your thread one and thread two. So basically by having multi-thread, you're able to access more power of the computer and be able to access and do more information. So let's say hypothetically you have a software program that's going out to, let's say, to, um, Google, and it's grabbing information from Google's website. And you're getting that information back on your website, but your website is a third party and it's being shipped over to another group, a bigger group than Google. And where the information is stored at. Well, what's going to be important with that process is how fast you get it from Google, how fast you you process the information, massage the data, and then push it out to that third third person. Um, you know, you, you, maybe it's your web application, whatever the case is. What comes in handy is you have multiple multiple threads 
going, that means you're able to process information quicker. So let's say hypothetically, you know, an average uh, every minute you're able to get hmm, 30,000 records, but that's not good enough. You need to be able to get 90,000 records. Well, by multi-threading, if it's established the right way, 90,000 records a minute, pretty good. You do the math, you know, you're getting a lot of records in an hour. So that, the more records, the more data that's flown. So that would be very important to um, kind of understand how the threading works. Um, let's see here, I'm just kind of going through some of the important areas um, of the, uh, of the um, system itself. Um, Let's see here, so you have your CPU, okay. So if you look on page 56, there's a diagram on 2.11. Um, older methods of processor interfacing with memory. So they have an AMD quad-core memory access. So you have the CPU on each side, but it shows you where you have the, um, each processor contains memory controller. And as you flow down through the hyper transport bus, um, it, it uses the expansion slot. So, Basically, um, the uh, in the past, dual processors were most beneficial in servers and gaming PCs where software was written for and could take advantage of the two-processor technology. But today, with the multi-core processors, are useful to anyone. Um, so it's not just specific to one type of technology. So all applications could take advantage of the multi-core technology as well as the background processes that are associated with the OS and the application. So it's basically showing you uh, it, with the AMD quad core memory access is showing you how in the past, you know, a server would take advantage of it versus a regular computer. Nowadays, it could be both. Um, virtualization um, is very important. Uh, virtualization is like I mentioned, it's well, there's a lot of cool things going on with virtualization. So what is vir virtualization? It's having one or two machines, virtual machines, on the same computer. Virtualization software such as VMware Workstation or Microsoft Hyper-V, or it doesn't have it, but um, it talks about um, Parallels, which is another Microsoft program, allows one computer to act as if it were two or more computers. So let's say that we had, let's say we had a server, okay? Um, this server is, um, it has, I don't know, two terabytes of storage on the server. And it has um, the most most memory that it can do is we'll say it's 64, um, oh geez, 64 gigabytes of, of memory. Well, actually, 128 gigabytes of memory. So that's a lot of memory. So um, it's running a Windows 2012 server. Now, let's say you have. Uh, you have an environment and you want to set up an environment that does this this server right here houses your databases we'll say okay this is your database farm and let's say that you want to maximize that so you do the math let's say the average person you want to allow them to have at least um 20 gigabytes of memory at the most so you know you're looking at um i don't know about what eight well, 740, 626, you're looking about at least six virtual machine, virtual environments that can live on this box. So this box probably costs roughly 20 grand, okay? So you want to, instead of buying six of these boxes, you just set them up in virtual environments. So think of it as here, you have virtual one, and it has, let's say it has um, 10 gigabytes, um, I don't know, um, 500 gigabytes, well, it won't even have that. Let's say it has 125 gigabytes of storage, it has it, um, 10, gig 10 gig gigabytes, and that's virtual one. Then you might have virtual two, and you can have more, but let's say this one's 20 gigs, it's maxed out, and it's using uh, 500 gigabytes of storage. Not a problem. All right, so you get the gist. You have all these virtual environments are running separately. They're not affecting each other. Well, 
how can they be a problem? Well, it, it depends on, if it's a database environment, it just depends on how it's established. Um, but a database can be a problem if one server, if they're using shared memory. In this case, they're using dedicated. They're, they're set at that memory. So what's basically nice about this is you could have, we'll set up three and four, and we'll just, we won't put any, any real thought into this. But let's say uh, virtual three, virtual four. All right. So we'll just, we don't know what they are. All right. So basically, let's say I'm setting up a new application, new application. And I know that I need, I need, um, well, let's see here, I need two app servers, application servers. Um, one's my primary, and the other is my secondary. So it's basically my failover, um, in case the other one can't spell. Um, we need like a disaster recovery, that, that our backup, and then we need disaster recovery. So we have th three servers actually. Uh, primary, where the flow of traffic goes at. The second one is um, basically clustered inf information. Um, and then the other one is recovery. And then we need database servers. So it's gonna use the same thing. Primary, uh, secondary, and disaster recovery, let's we'll say DR. But then we need three web servers. Same thing, primary, secondary, and DR. All right, so basically what this means in a nutshell, if I was setting up this environment, I need nine servers, that's a lot. And if I would go buy nine individual box servers, they could be anywhere from 20 to 50,000 a box. So 20, we'll say average is $30,000 in environment, okay? 30K in an environment. All right, no big deal. So, well, that is. So that's like $270,000 right there for nine servers. And those are only good for a five-year plan. And then you have to switch them out. So that's a lot of money just in the, the hardware itself. But by using a virtual server, all that could go away. So, you know, you might have these virtual environments and you could sit, you, you might not want to have, you might have, have all of them. So let's say virtual um, box number one right here has six environments. Well, we could fit our application server all on that and leave more room for more application servers if we need to. Um, and the same thing with the uh, database and web server. So each environment, each form, Form one would be like database, form two would be um, uh, application, and form three would be web server. The, the key is you want to keep them all in separate boxes. But you have three boxes where you could expand that knowledge, but also the disaster recovery is going to be in a different location. But just kind of giving you an idea, you could have multiple da disaster recoveries. You might have four envir six environments. You might have a disaster recovery for application ABC, then you might have another comp another group that has another application that's using that. See, the virtual environment comes up really quick. And you can set up a new environment within like um, five minutes. It's quick. So if you ever get a chance, start on your computer. If you have a if you have a, um, if you have a Mac and you use VMware, you'll see what I mean. It's really quick. Um, let's see here. Sockets and slots. We'll skip through that. Um, processing cooling, very important. Uh, most of us know that, you know, looking at the... On the central processing unit, there's a fan and a, and a heat sink. It cools down the, uh, the system. It allows uh, the proper flow, air to flow through. Um, without that, your board will blow up. I tried it as a demonstration one time just to see how quick. It took 30 seconds and my board was fried, um, which the board was very cheap and it was a, a, good, a good, good example to uh, see how it works. Um, one of the tips when, like, if you're installing, like, a processor, like a CPU, for example, um, talking a little bit about CPUs, always hold the CPU by the edges to avoid bending or touching the pins 
underneath. Do not ever lay the CPU down on a flat surface because the pins can easily bend. Um, and short of the power to the computer is off, obviously, and the computer is unplugged, place the um, a wrist strap band around your wrist just to basically um, uh, prevent um, uh, 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 an electric current from coming through. Um, and then you slowly insert the CPU into the slot. And when you insert it in there, it has those pins. It, it'll fit in there nice and tight. But before you slap it down, just make sure it's nice and firm and it looks good. And slap it down. Um, and then you should be fine. Let's see here. Moving on, I'm just trying to look what else that we need to discuss. This, um, let me pull this up. This slide right here is the one I was talking about the CPU, how it, it used to be used on servers only, but now it's used on computers itself. And this right here is kind of a, a demonstration of how you install the CPU itself. Um, you want to hold it on the side as, as it mentioned here. Um, uh, this diagram right here shows you where the heatsink goes at. Um, that's on top of this. So it's sitting right there. Here's the CPU. The heatsink will sit on top of the um, CPU for cooling. Um, when you put the heatsink on the CPU, there is a liquid um, gel that you put on top of it so it stays on there. And then the fan goes on top of that. Um, this right here just shows you an illustration of how the power source flows. So you have the fan from the power source that flows down. So you have a lot of fan support, which is good. Um, this right here talks a little bit about the slots on the motherboard. These are your PCI slots. This is your ACG, your AGP, your Silligrated Graphics Port. Um, but here's your PCI, your Peripheral Component Interconnect. You'll have more of these. You'll only have one AGP on your board. You'll never see more than one. Um, and then here's your industry standard technology that's there, listed there. Um, your CPUs here. This right here is where all your memory is stored at. Um, so depending on what type of memory you have. And then the other components are like the little chipsets that are installed. Uh, this right here is a slot that um, gets plugged from the power supply. So when you plug the power supply, it plugs into here, which powers the computer. Um, these guys on the side are um, extra ports that are plugged on the board. So it would be like audio, it could be um, USB and so forth. Um, let's see here. These are different boards. You could go from an ATX to a micro to a mini and so forth. And as you see, the smaller it is, the less that it can handle. Um, kind of not go through that. Uh, in a nutshell, it doesn't explain enough technology. I will look at page 79 and it shows a really good example diagram of the uh, motherboard. It's really good. Um, talks about the super input output chip, talks about the dim memory, it talks about the um, CMOS battery backup. A lot of good stuff there that you won't find that I don't have uh, an illustration for. Um, to explain to you. Um, let's see what else. That's basically in a nutshell. Um, if you page on page 80, you'll talk about motherboard troubleshooting and you know, the common symptoms that'll happen um, when you have a problem with the motherboard if it doesn't start up. Um, but in a nutshell, the, the, these videos that I do are just going to be you know basic, common, high level stuff. Make sure you read the chapter, do the labs um, that I provide in each week, and then I, I believe the uh, you certify will be very helpful going forward for our class. So once again, uh, thank you for listening to me for 40 minutes, and if you have any questions, um, please reach out to me. Thanks.